Welcome to Monday Night Show. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the HPV vaccine. Are you confused about it? Should you get it for yourself or for your children? Well, tonight we're going to go, we're going to dive deep into that vaccine, okay? My name is Lori Faulkner. I'm part of Women's Health on the Go, where I provide video consultations to women to discuss their women's health issues and talk about conventional treatment options, natural, holistic ways to take care of their bodies. Um, welcome to everyone. People who come here all the time, welcome back. And if you're new, welcome. One thing that I love during my show is I love it when you say hello. I love it when you have questions. I love it when you share this video because this information is going to be important. So we want to make sure that we get it out there as far as we can. So if you can share it, if you can say hello, comment whenever you can. If you have a question, sometimes it's a little bit easier if I see the word question before. And if you're watching it on the replay, comment away. I will see it. I will get the comments. I will get everything. If you want to show a reminder, just comment a reminder below. So again, what are we going to be doing tonight? We're going to be talking about the HPV vaccine. I'm going to be talking about what the vaccine is. I'm going to be talking about cervical cancer statistics. I'm going to go over the package insert. I'm going to talk about side effects, post-marketing um, reactions, and some other kind of data and research that's coming out about it and about what you can do. Now, as I do with all of my shows, I always put that medical disclaimer out. And I will tell you that all material provided in this video is provided on for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to substitute the, the advice of your healthcare provider. Um, it's not meant to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any kind of disease. Make sure that you talk to your healthcare provider, you review and discuss any symptoms that you have or anything that's discussed tonight make sure that you review it with your healthcare provider as well, okay? And if you're here, please say hello. I love to, um, I love to hear from people. Okay, so if you're watching the pre-show, you kind of know this, but I am going to repeat it again. Why am I doing this show? I'm doing this show because a lot of people ask me questions about the HPV vaccine. They want to know whether they should get it or not. So as I feel as a healthcare provider, my job is to provide the facts to you. The information I'm going to be giving you today is from the FDA, from the CDC, from Up to Date, which is a um, a website that it, it's a membership um, uh, mem bleh, membership a website that um, provider providers do to look for all up to date research. And then I'm also going to talk about it's called Sane Vax, which is an organization of eight women. Um, two of them are from. Uh, children who were affected by the vaccine, but the other ones are research analysis, they're, you know, data collectors, or all these kind of um, important people. So I got some data from them as well. So um, I'm just providing the facts to everybody, okay? Um, and I'm not telling you whether to get the vaccine or not. That is a choice for you to make on your own, okay? Hello, Dave. How are you? You missed, I did a joke during the pre-show. It was just for you. So hopefully, um, if you see the replay, maybe you can catch it. All right. So let's get into the HPV vaccine. All right. So very, very brief. We know HPV is there's a hundred strains or probably over a hundred strains of HPV. Okay. And there's a handful of them that are linked to cervical cancer. They can cause the changes that can lead to cervical cancer. Um, and then there's some of them that can cause genital warts, okay? So they came up with some vaccines that will help protect people um, against those, a couple of the strains, okay? Now, um, there are currently three vaccines out there, okay? The first one was introduced in 2006, which to me is still kind of fairly, to me, in the early stages. Um, now, the first vaccine only protects you against four strains, okay? Two of the strains that they protect you against are for genital warts, and then the other two, which is 16 and 18, is for the, the high, what we call high-risk HPV. Now, mind you, there is about, there's over, a little over 13 of the high-risk HPV strains, so it's only protecting you against two of them, okay? And, but those two are the most common that 
cause the changes that can lead to cervical cancer, okay? Now, that's, that's the first one that came out in 2006. There was one in 2009 that came out called Cervarix. Now, that only does two strains, okay? Um, that does for strain 16 and 18, which again, is the most common high-risk strain, okay? Then, just in 2014, Gardasil came out with Gardasil 9, okay? So, it still has the two genital warts, right? And then the seven are of the high-risk strain, but again, it's very important to know when it comes to this HPV vaccine because a lot of people will think, well, I'm good to go. You're not good to go. There are still other strains of HPV, high-risk strain, that can still cause changes that could possibly lead to cervical cancer. Now, that is very, very important because I cannot begin to tell you how many people come into, you know, I, they get an abnormal pap smear, they have to get a colposcopy, which is, you know, after, if you have an abnormal, to see exactly what's going on. And they're like, but I had the vaccine. I, I don't care. I mean, I, I mean, I do care, but that, unfortunately, that is a very common comment that people say to me. So you can still have those strains. So you still have to make sure that you go for your pap smears, okay? Um, now, let's see. Oh, and the one other thing that's really, really, really important to make, to know, is not all cervical cancers are from the HPV. Now it is, there's a very, it's very rare that it's not linked to HPV, but again, there is the possibility that you can develop cervical cancer and it's not related to the HPV virus, okay? All right, how is the vaccine given? Now, the vaccine is right now currently, initially it was just for the girls. Then they kind of introduced the boys. And the guidelines are kind of the same for the both. The, they start the vaccines around the age 11 or 12 years old, and you can, but you can get it up to 26 years of age. Excuse me. Um, now, they just recently um, introduced a new schedule. So anybody that is up to, um, up to 15 years of age, they only need to get two at zero, the, you know, the initial one, and then six months apart, okay? And then anybody that's 15 or older, they're still recommending that you get the three-part series, which is zero, which is when you have it, one to two months later, and then at six months. Now, the only, the reason why they changed, see, this is what I always find interesting. The reason that they changed the initial one to the two-part series is they, you know, they follow people and they kind of see their immunity over the years and they've determined that two actually, you know, you, you have still have a, a high um, immunity against the HPV strains. But the efficiency of actually, you know, does it actually work has never been determined. I hope that kind of makes sense. Um, I hope that kind of makes sense. All right, what I'm going to do, because I got a question real quick. Esther, um, how often should you get a PAP when you are diagnosed with high-risk HPV? Esther, that's a big loaded question. It really kind of depends on, it really depends. If you just have high-risk HPV, typically we repeat the PAP smear in a year. Most of the time you're going to resolve it, and then you're going back to routine screening. If you have HPV and you have some abnormal uh, cells and you have a what's called a colposcopy and depending on the result of the colposcopy depends on if you come back in a year or you have to go out for treatment so that's a real short kind of answer um, and hopefully that kind of answers your question because um, that could be another whole show but that's basically when it comes to that um, every you have positive repeat it next year if you're negative, then you just go to routine screening, which is anywhere from three to five years, depending on your age, okay? All right, so that is basically the HPV vaccine, just a short of what exactly it is and how it is given, okay? Now I wanna talk about some cervical cancer statistics. And the reason why I wanna talk about this is because um, I wanted to put it into kind of perspective for you guys of, you know, we're, we're vaccinating all these people, but let's look actually at the incidence of 
cervical cancer and hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense when um when we go through everything because i got slides yay um i love slides um okay now first i'm going to do the first slide okay and this is just um let's see rates okay oh wait hold on let me get rid of this and then let me give rates. Okay, so this slide I got from the National Cancer Institute, okay? And they, just to show you basically what is going on right now, typically we have about 12,000 cases of um, cervical cancer a year. That's going to kind of be like a little bit of an average over the um over the past few years and about 4,000 deaths of um that will happen every year okay now what i want to kind of tell you too is, is that i, I kind of did <laughs> there is in the the last statistics that they did on the population in the u.s was back in um 2012. there are 308 million people approximately in the united states at that time i'm sure it's increased because so many people are, are having babies these days but 308. About 50.8% are female. So let's just say 50% of the population is female. That is 154 million women in this country. Now, 80% of those women at some point in their lifetime is going to be exposed and get the HPV virus. Okay. Now, now this is how, and I, I, I probably did this a couple of times because I'm always like, you know, trying to use my calculator when you're trying to make a do a calculator with 154 million in the calculator. Sometimes it's like, oh, did I do that right? But I figured out that 0.008% of the females are going to get cervical cancer every year, which not that those are not, I mean, those women, you know, I, I don't wish that on anybody. But it's really a very, it's a very small percentage of women that are actually going to develop cervical cancer. And we're, and when, when we get more into the package insert and all the stuff that it's happening with the HPV vaccine, it's, to me, it's almost like, why are we doing all of this? Um, Cause there's, there's a lot of people having a lot of reactions to this vaccine when we're gonna listen, we're gonna see a little bit more. Okay, now the next thing that I want to kind of show you is now when we, now we're talking right now, there's about 12,000 cases, approximately 12,000 a year. Okay, now what I want to show you is um, 2006. Now, 2000, remember, 2006 is when the, um, the first HPV vaccine um, came out. Okay, now I got this from the Cancer, Cancer Journal of Four Clinicians. And it was in 2006. And what they basically do is they go through every form of cancer and they find the statistics of that cancer for that year. Now you can see, um, I just took the whole section. I know that sometimes I wish I can have the top, but I'm just trying to, you know, show you guys. Um, it's a very big file. It's a very big um, chart. So you can see genital um, system. The first one is uterine cervix. And then under, underneath, just so you will know what uterus corpuses, that's the corpus is like the, the body, like the womb area, okay, where the cervix obviously is the cervix. Now, in that year, we had only 9,710 cases of cervical cancer, and we had about 3,700 deaths. Now, when you, what's, to me, what's interesting is, is that from that year, the statistics have gone up, and we're going to, I'm going to show you a couple of slides down um, why this might be happening, which is really, really interesting. Um, actually, you know what? I'm going to show them to you right now. Okay. So, all right. Now these slides I've gotten from the, okay. So this is really, really, really amazing. You know, I'm always doing this, you know, research for the shows and even I'm learning. You know what? Life is about learning. And even though I believe that I'm the queen of HPV, I know so much because I, I, you know, I really love talking and educating women about it. Um, I totally learned something about HPV. Now, HPV is what we know is something that we get from having sex with somebody who has the virus, right? Now, 
there is actually some research out there that shows that HPV can be transmitted by what we call vertical transmission. What is that? What that is is that when you, if you have HPV and you have a baby and that baby comes out, that you can pass the virus to your child. Now, it was, you know, it's, they didn't have like a huge amount of people that that happened to, but they, and they say, we need more research on this, but it's not being done, which I think is amazing, but this is where it comes into play. Now, there's research. Now, I got these, this information from the FDA. Now, hopefully I can explain this because it, it can be a little confusing. Research can be very confusing when you're trying to get through it. Okay, now the HPV vaccine is going to help prevent someone from getting the exact strains that it covers from getting it. If you've already been exposed to the HPV virus, it's not going to help, it's not gonna cure, it's not gonna treat, it's not gonna do anything. Now, this is like a twofold kind of situation because one, are we having actually incidents of vertical transmission, okay? And two, there are people who come in, they have an abnormal pap smear, you know, they have a colposcopy, and there's providers saying, well, you better get the HPV vaccine, you know? What if it's a strain that's, you know, what if it's 16 or 18 strain, and now, you know, those strains are more at a higher risk of actually developing cervical cancer. Now, hopefully that all makes sense. But what's really interesting, now this is from the FDA people, okay? Now, hopefully you can kind of understand this slide. Hold on, let's see. And we're going to go in, let's see, hold on one second. Uh, okay. Now, what this slide is showing you is that you have the, the Gardasil people, okay, and you have the placebo, basically meaning that they didn't have... Um, you know, they didn't get the actual vaccine, okay? And we're looking at the incidence of actually, this is, this is, okay. These are people who were, were they either um, tested culture positive, and which is this the one that both and or, or, and or zero positive for the HPV strain, okay? So this was on day one of getting the vaccine, okay? So right before they got the vaccine, they did this blood work and they did the cultures and then they gave them the vaccine, okay? Now, what this is showing is, is that the people who got the vaccine is actually at a higher incident of actually developing either CIN, what we call CIN 2 or 3, okay, which is basically mild to basically precancerous changes, okay? Now, I know it's a little bit hard to sometimes under, well, actually, I, I, this, yeah, I did the and or, okay. This slide, this, I know it's so hard to understand research and data and stuff like that, but when you see that negative 33, basically that what, what that is kind of saying to you is, is that people who, had the HPV prior to the vaccine, right? Which you don't might not necessarily know the strain as well. And then they get the vaccine that they're at a higher risk of actually developing cervical dysplasia. Does that make sense? Let me know if that makes sense. Cause sometimes when we're kind of reading data and when we're trying to explain research, it can be a little cuckoo. That's the only way I can say, but let me know if that makes sense because I think that's really, really, really important to know because one, does this vertical transmission actually, it, does it really exist? Is it significant? We need more research on that. And then also the other, the other thing is, is that, um, Jules, hi, oh my God, so happy to see you. Um, the other reason is, is that sometimes when people, there's people that, I come in, I get an abnormal pap smear, you know, I have, you know, my colposcopy and stuff like that. And then my provider actually says, well, you better get the, the HPV vaccine to help cover yourself. Um, now, Jules, from what I can understand from the research, because you know, you know, Jules, I know that you know how research is, is that it has to do with the components, with the immunology and what they're actually giving to the person in the vaccine. 
hopefully that kind of makes sense. Because, you know, every vaccine is kind of made, you know, some are of, of active life, some are, are not, some of the, the DNA, you know, like it, we can go, that's another whole kind of conversation about going deep into vaccines. But they believe from what I can read from the kind of research is that it has to do with what they are actually using in the vaccine. I hope that makes sense. It, not, not necessarily the extra components, but the actual, the way that they're creating the HPV in order to give it into the vaccine. That's from what I can understand from the research, but we need more research. We definitely need more research on this. So, um, yeah, hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Okay. Um, and then another thing, one more slide that I want to show you, um, is the deaths over, um, of, let's see, new cases versus deaths. Okay, hold on one more. I got one more. I got to just find out which one it is here. All right. All right. So this is, um, this is going to be my last slide, everybody. So this slide is showing you just the, the death rates and the new cases. I mean, you can see, I mean, if you think about it, look how much it decreased. This is the decrease in new cases, especially before and when we, if you look at 2006, right? That's all from pap smears and screenings. That's what that is from. And if you look from, if you think about 2006, 2006 is when the vaccine kind of, that's when the Gardasil came out. The, the rate is kind of like, it doesn't really go down that much anymore. And I got this from the National Cancer Institute. And on that website, and I'm going to quote exactly what it says. It says, using statistical models for analysis, rates of new cancer uteri can new cancer uteri cancer cases have not changed significantly over the past 10 years. Death rates have been falling on an average of 0.8% each year. Um, from 2005 to 2015. So I just think that that's interesting research. And why I think that's interesting is because, you know, I read something um, on, on a research and for the life of me, I could not find it again, which drives me insane. But it said something along the fact that, oh, the, the HPV vaccine is doing so awesome. It's, you know, decreased the amount of cervical cancer rates by like 3,000 a year, which that when you look at the National Cancer Institute, they're saying something completely different. So, um, yeah. So, okay, yes, Nancy, it is scary, but it makes sense. Um, Dave says, if that's the case, why get the vaccine? That's up for you. Remember, I'm only providing the information to you for, for everyone to make an informed decision. You know, I that's something that you all have to make up for yourself. I don't want to sit here and say, oh, don't get the vaccine. I'm just providing the facts. Um, yeah, that's okay. Jules, yeah, it sounds like if HP already present the vaccine might cause more changes rather than prevent other strains. So, yeah, so that's where we are so far, okay? And, um, and also just remember that you have to make sure that you still go, even if you decide to get the HPV vaccine, please, 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 please make sure that you still go to your healthcare provider and get your pap smears when you need to, okay? Um, that's really important because that is, pap smears have decreased the cervical cancer rate by like 70% since it's been in, in, in inception, I think that's the word. So, you know, pap smears, go get them. Go get them, girls. Um, Susie, hi, so why push the vaccine on boys too? Well, if you think about it, if females, 80% of them are gonna get, you know, the HPV, then 80% of the boys out there. And, you know, why, why don't we protect the boys as well so that they don't pass it to the girls kind of thing. Um, and after all, why should us girls always have to be doing everything? Let's give something to those boys, right? I just always think us girls, we're always doing, we're always doing everything, aren't we? Okay. Um, so it will be interesting to see if anybody, um, how's everybody feeling out there about the vaccine? Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what you guys think. 
Okay, so like I said, it's important to get your pap smears if you have to get anal screening as well. There are such things as anal pap smears, um, depending on your medical situation and your background, um, especially if you are HIV positive and you have had a history of cervical dysplasia or genital warts, it's really important that you get that. Um, and just because you get the vaccine does not mean that you are 100% um, covered, okay? All right, so, um, yes, Jules, we do need more women's health research funding. We do. Us girls, we do. Um, Pierce's doctor is going to push this on him tomorrow. Ugh. Well, Susie, why don't you just take a copy of this, you know, um, this presentation and say, hey, doc, why don't you watch this and see what, what you think? Um, Dave says it seems to me it might have something to do with money. It's a pharmaceutical, everybody. There are a very, um, a very, very rich um, organization. They make a lot of money. So um, I can go into pharmaceuticals. Woof, I can go into pharmaceuticals. Okay. Um, all right. So package insert. Okay. So there's some things now, this is something that I did not know. Um, but you know, typically if someone gets a vaccine, um, it, actually in my department, we don't really do the vaccine to be honest with you. It's usually taken care of in Pete. So, um, we don't really do it, but do you know that if you have a severe re allergic reaction to yeast, you should not get the vaccine because there's actually yeast in it. I did not know that. Um, of course, if you've ever had any previous sensitivity to a previous injection that you've had with the um, HPV, um, and what I find is always interesting when you see these vaccines is the vaccine might not give immunity to all people who get the vaccine. So you might get it and you might not even, um, you might not anything happen to you. And when, you know, typical side effects, of course, you know, pain, swelling at the site maybe happen. The one big thing is, um, syncopal, which is um, passing out. It's very common in this vaccine. Um, they typically want you to sit for 15 minutes. Um, it is also associated with seizure-like activity, um, which, they, which they say is usually transient and restored after someone who is put in the supine or the Trendelenburg position. Supine is basically laying here. Trendelenburg is when you take, if this is your head and you put it down, that's what Trendelenburg is. Um, but as we're going to see as we go down, there are some people that it, it's not just transient. It happens and it keeps happening. Um, and a lot of people um, have severe reactions. Um, okay. Whew, I'll tell you, this is a lot. <laughs> Okay, so there is um, some, and the insert also just talks about, they did some research about, because, you know, sometimes when you go and get a vaccine, um, especially if you're getting vaccines when you're younger, you get like 50 of them in one shot. Not literally 50 of them, but they're just jabbing you away. So they did do some research to show that, you know, is it safe to do it with such as um, uh, Minactra, um, which has Tdap in it um, and menococcal, and then they also did it with um, the hepatitis one as well. And they show that those were okay to do with, but they'd never like research like should you be getting with any other vaccines such as the flu vaccine. So, um, but I think from what I understand, from what I you know kind of read, a lot of people sometimes get both of those vaccines at the same time. So if you are going to get the vaccine, suppose you're going with your child and you do get the flu vaccine, maybe suggest not getting them together. Um, just because they didn't know they didn't do any research, there's there's no clinical data that says that it's safe. Um, I would just want to make sure that. You know, there's that whole debate or whole conversation about the MMR, which is the measles, mumps, and rebellia, and, you know, separating them versus putting them all together and the effects that it can have um, on people. So I would just personally, if you're going to get that vaccine, um, I would just say, you know what, I'm going to get the flu vaccine today, but I'm going to come back in a week or two and just get the Gardasil or the uh, Cer Cervarix um, one. All right, so let's talk about post-marketing reactions, okay? Now, what happens when they do research on any pharmaceutical? This is not just the flu, this HPV vaccine, it's anything. So typically, 
depending on what the medication is for as well. Now, a vaccine, they're going to do the research on perfectly healthy people, okay? They are the top prize people out there. Now, so what happens is, is that they get approval and because it's all on hunky-dory people. And then what happens after every pharmaceutical goes on the market, you have what's called post-marketing reactions. That's why typically people will say, you know, oh, don't take that medication like the first five years or so because that's when we're really going to know what it's going to do to you, okay? So now I got this information. Now this is, oh, there's lots of information out there. There is also a, um, a vaccine registration if you have any kind of um, reactions, that there's a registry on there. There's also, um, I did mention um, the Sane Vax organization. They are an organization um, of eight women, um, eight women. Two of them did, they're just advocates because their daughters were severely affected by the vaccine. Um, and then there's research analysis, data analysis, they're, they're really like, they're scientists and stuff like that. And they have actually presented to the FDA why Gardasil should not be given. So it's it's really kind of an amazing organization um, and uh, a lot of data. You know, it's not like... You know, sometimes you go to websites and you're like, all right, is this a real website? Like, is this a hokey dokey? Like, who are these people and why are they doing this? And what is the actual data? And, you know, it's really, really interesting. So these are the kind of post-marketing reactions. Now, you know, some of them may happen to more people than others, and some may just be a few. But to me, they're still, you know, they're still really important. Um, one is autoimmune hemolytic anemia, which is a severe blood disorder where your body actually, it's like an autoimmune, it actually destroys your red blood cells, which can be very serious. Um, pul pulmonary embolus, which is basically a blood clot in your lungs, again, very serious. Um, this one, now I'm going to print and not pronounce this correctly, I can guarantee you. Asthenia, asthenia, I know that's wrong, but basically it's a loss of strength and energy. And when I was doing, you know, research and when I was looking at um, even people who actually would come, you know, they would do videos and talk about what happened to them. This seems to be a common one. Um, I've seen a lot of people who afterwards just have no energy anymore. They don't want to do anything. They sleep all the time. Um, there's one girl, oh my God, it was so sad. She actually, to me, it was almost like a Gillian Barr um, kind of syndrome. She just started losing loss of her legs and it's slowly been creeping up. And it's like up to her neck. She's like completely paralyzed. Um, so um, death has occurred, um, joint and muscle pain. Um, again, I just talked about a little bit about the Gillian Barr syndrome, which is something that can happen after a vaccine. Um, it's it's really really out there. There are a lot of lot of cases of this stuff. It's really. I never realized, to be honest with you, how much it has affected. I mean. Let me just put it away this way. Japan has banned it from their country, okay? They no longer have it. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, but they, they, don't, even, they don't even allow it anymore because of the effects that have happened on their children. Um, so, and then there's also acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, okay, which is a widespread attack of inflammation on the brain and the spinal cord, which can happen from a viral a bacterial infection, or it says a rare from the MMR vaccine, but they're starting to see this also with the Gardasil vaccine, um, which is, you know, it can be either mild to moderate. It can be life, lifelong impairment ranging from cognitive difficulties, weakness, loss of vision, and numbness. Um, so this stuff is happening. And when I did, there was... Um, there was a research, I don't know if you want to call it research, some of these things that were articles that basically like Japan, Japan presented all of their information. Now, and this was only based on 44 of their children, they're, they're, you know, because at that point they were only giving it um, to um, girls at that point. And in the 44 um, cases, they had, um, I'm going to read them because, you know, 
can't remember everything inside my head, but frequent manifestations include headaches, general fatigue, coldness of the legs, limb, excuse me, limb pain and weakness, excuse me, complex regional pain syndrome, which end up being chronic pain in arms and legs, um, postural um, orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which is a reduced blood flow from standing up, from, like from sitting to standing up, where I've seen, quite, you know, in all this kind of research, everything that I'm doing about this, um, I saw a lot of people where like now they have to slowly get out of bed every day because it, it affected them so much. Um, in Finland, now in Finland, they started their vaccine program in, tw in November of 2013. And because of all of these reactions that they're, you know, the allegations, that these reactions are still happening, they are starting to also, they're, they're seeing the reactions and they're getting, they're starting a database. So if, <laughs> I, you know, to me personally, if we're seeing all this and it's, you know, over and over again seems to be linked to the this vaccine, then why are we why are we not doing anything about this? I mean, you know, that's my personal opinion. Again, I'm just, you know, providing you the facts. Um, yeah, I'm just providing the facts. Um, in 2015, the Danish are stating that we need more research on the, the, the effects that it has on the nervous system because of those um, after that occurs after the vaccine, people are having neurological kind of problems. Um, and then the last time I did the flu vaccine, I also talked about the Cochrane um, report and their, their review. So the Cochrane um, database or organization or whatever you want to call them, um, basically they are independent, right? So they, they're not, you know, they're not for, they're not against, you know, they're not pharmaceutical reps or anything like that, but they're scientists, they're researchers. Um, and they will take, they take lots of things, lots of health, medical conditions. And what they do is they review everything, every research, every like piece of paper that the FDA puts out or the CDC on a certain thing. And this of course was the Gardasil vaccine that I was you know, reviewing. So um, a couple of things that I found interesting in their research and in what they were reviewing is, is that they were noticing that throughout the FDA process, um, the protocols kind of changed for it, which impacted the outcomes. They also were not, there's certain, apparently, I guess, which kind of makes sense. Um, there are certain steps that you have to take in order for FDA approval. You know, you got to do step one, then you got to do step two, step three. Well, they also found that, um, that they didn't actually follow them, like, you know, they didn't really follow them appropriately, which I think is interesting. Um, they were also trying to fast track it through, it talks about how they were fast tracking this vaccine. So they had to change the certain outcomes to the research and um, how they didn't really follow the guidelines. And that they actually, I, wanted, I wonder if I can find the exact, they actually said that, oh yeah, they believe, um, uh, they believe proper scientific contact was not upheld by the FDA or any of the academic journals that actually, you know, published um, these research findings. They also said that they would like the F, you know, the pharmaceutical company to actually publish all of their research findings because I, I guess apparently not all the findings have been publicized. So I just think that's kind of interesting. Um, they definitely think that more research is, is to be needed. So that is kind of, now I know there is so much more out there. I, I prepped for the show many, many hours um, reading a lot of stuff. I'm sure that I did not get everything. Um, but I think that the one thing that impacted me the most when I was researching this is the amount of people that, girls, that have been affected by this, like their lives are affected forever. I mean, there's one girl that's paralyzed. I mean, I'm sure there's more than one, but I saw a girl that was paralyzed. I saw how people would say, I used to, I used to want to go out. I want to do this, but now I'm just, I'm weak and I'm tired. And, and I, you know, it's, it's really, really sad to see and to see how like another country actually is banned it from their, they've banned it, you know, 
well, if they did, well, why aren't we doing something about this? Um, of course, again, this is my personal opinion. You have to make up your own choice, your own decision, because it's your body, it's your life, you know, it's your health. But I think that it's really important that we discuss these, these issues. Um, I recently saw a, um, a video or something. Um, they were military people and it was like the health clinic and they're like promoting like, you know, the HPV vaccine. And I feel like finding, I wish I could find that video and go back and go, let me send you some research people because we need to be telling people the research that's out there and exactly what's going on so that everybody is informed. Because I think that, I think that when people go to their healthcare provider, a lot of the times they rely on that healthcare provider to do what's best for them. And there's also, like, I think I saw a comment from Susie about how, you know, she's taking her son to the pediatrician and the pediatrician is just going to push it. You know what I mean? And they, they just, they, sometimes healthcare providers don't really talk to people. They just go, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you, you, you should be doing this. You should be doing this. And I think that, you know, actually, there was another video that I saw, and this was really, really interesting. The girl had the package insert, right? Now, I got the package insert from online, right? But it was actually a package insert from um, the thing. And, you know, there's a tear-off section that each parent is supposed to get that, you know, that whole little tear-off so that they can read it and understand everything. And then after they read it, then go, okay, I want the, you know, I want the my child to get the vaccine or I want to get the vaccine because although it's not um, FDA approved for people over 26 years of age, there are places that still give it if people want the vaccine. It's just that they haven't done the research to see if it's worked um, in that age group. So, but there are places that will do that vaccine. So I'd be interesting to know, are people getting those inserts? Are they reading it? Because I think that if you read it, some of the stuff that I talked about in the package insert, just about, you know, the risk of seizures and stuff like that is there, you know? Um, so hopefully that all makes sense. So that being said, <laughs> what can you do? Um, one, if you are still thinking about doing the HPV vaccine, definitely have a try to have a conversation with your healthcare provider. If you still want to have some, you know, if you want to talk more about it, you know, I'm always, you know, you can always book an appointment with me to discuss it further. Um, but definitely, there's lots of information out there. Even if you just print the package insert out and like highlight the things that, you know, that make you concerned at the end of that package insert, there is like kind of research and stuff. Um, you know, you got to read that, read it. That's all I'm going to say. Um, go get your pap smears when you are supposed to remember some time before I said that pap smears have decreased cervical cancer incidents by like 70, 74% over the past 40 years. Here, let me show you this. I'm going to show it to you one more time because I think that this is a good one. Uh, okay, see, look at this. This is all the way from back in 1975. Look at how that line just kept going down and down. I mean, it, it has definitely. And when 2006 came in and the vaccine, I don't know, did it really go down after that? I, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe we have to wait for the vaccine to be around a lot longer. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer. But pap smears, talk to, your, talk to your daughter, talk to your sons about safe sex. I mean, to me, you know, 80% of the population, you're going to get HPV. You're just going to, you know, to me, sometimes I say to people, you haven't got to go get it. Be like the rest of us, you know, but... I think that we have to educate and be open with our children. The fact of the matter is, is that teaching, I mean, teach whatever you want, okay? But I'm just gonna tell you that I've worked in clinics. I am a women's health nurse practitioner. I've been doing this for a long time. Kids are still having sex, whether you teach them abstinence or not, they're doing it. They can come in like on our state, they can come to me without parental consent to get sexual women's health. So they, which I think is awesome when they come because they are aware and they know to come and discuss these things. But talk to your kids, 
talk to your kids about this. Talk about safe sex. Talk about, you know, I know when, you know, a lot of kids when they're younger, you know, they want to go out and explore and have a good time. But, you know, try to talk about like, you know, hey, maybe not, you know, have sex with like, you know, 10 people this year, you know, maybe keep it down, you know. I mean, but that's the reality. The reality is, is that our kids are having sex and they're experimenting with sex, which kudos to them. You know, I mean, the kids sometimes when they come to me, oh, sometimes I'm like, oh, how did you think of that? It's, you know, it's amazing. But these kids are doing it and we need to talk to them about safe sex. Be open and honest with them. And if you, as a, if you're watching this and you're a parent and you can't, then say, you know what? I'm going to have you go to a you know women's health nurse practitioner or a, a OBGYN or somebody so you have someone to talk to so that you know if you can't talk to me make sure you go talk to them because this is the key when we're younger this is when we're having more sex this is when we're going to get exposed to the HPV virus this is where it happens people right so if we can talk to them and we can be open and honest with them that is I think that's very, very powerful. I think that's very, very powerful. Make sure that you eat a healthy diet, even if your kids. There's lots of, like, when, when people come to me and they have HPV and they, um, you know, would have some abnormal postures and stuff like that, I talk about them, you know, this is a virus. If you don't take care of yourself, the virus is going to be like, yeah, get it on. I can do whatever I want. So eat right. Take folic acid. Folic acid is great. It helps. There's research that shows that if there are any changes, it's going to help those changes. It's going to prevent changes. Vitamins A, D, and C. Keep your immune system up. And the one biggest thing that you can do, no smoking cigarettes or quit smoking. Smoking and cervical cancer are highly linked together. Um, so those are just kind of some things just to, to get you started. So um, anyway, I hope that this is, I hope that this was informative for you guys. Um, this is what I want. I just want to get the information out there so that you, again, I'm not telling you to get the vaccine and I'm not telling you not to get the vaccine. What I'm telling you is to make sure that you go out and you educate yourself, do more research, do more research than what I've done here. I mean, I, this is just this, this like the tip of the, what do they call it, the tip of the iceberg. There's so much research that is emerging more and more about the HPV vaccine. So do that. Talk to someone. Talk to a provider that is open to talking about the pros and cons so that you can make an informed decision about your, for yourself and for your family, okay? Um, hi, Daniel. How are you? It's so good to see you. We just, I'm just wrapping up. We're talking about the HPV vaccine. Um, hopefully, I'm not quite sure if you just got on or how long you've been on, but um, I did a whole big thing about the HPV vaccine. So I'm hoping that everything here was informative to you. I hope everything made sense. And if you have any further questions, make sure that you comment below. Even if it's on the replay, I will see it and I will be able to answer your questions. If you want to get show reminders every week, every Monday night at 8 p.m., I'm here talking about something. So, um, you know, just comment below, reminder. You're going to get a text through your, your um, Facebook Messenger, and you're just going to have to hit reminder again because Facebook wants to make sure that you definitely want these reminders. And then every week, when I'm like, I usually send one to tell you what the subject's going to be. I tell you when we're live. And then in case you missed the show, then you just get another one. So it's not, it's not too bad. Um, I just want to make sure that you get to see the show. So reminder down below, share this video if you can with as many people as you can. That would be awesome. I love getting um, the information out to everyone. Um, and next week, we are going to be talking about sex and menopause. Woo! We're going to have a good time next week. I'm very excited. I got that um, topic from one of our viewers. Um, and if you have a topic that you would like to for me to discuss, bring it on. That's how I get my ideas. I get my ideas from you because guess what? I'm here for you guys. This is what I'm, I'm not here for, for me. I'm here to talk to you and to educate you and to get you as much information so that you can take care of your body conventionally if you want, naturally or holistically, however it is that you want. Okay, everybody? So... It was great this night. The show was great. Um, I hope it was a good one for you. And um, I will see you 
next week. Bye.